Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory. Named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch Podcast. And of course, welcome back to you too, mate. How are you? Good, mate, to you. Oh. The Pies girls, they just keep marching on. Ooh. I think they're going to play finals again this year. Terrific. Mate, you didn't even take a breath then, mate. Undefeated. Straight into it. Oh, it's just, you know, got to get it out there. Yeah. <laughs> I got a little... Uh, I got a little um, note from one of our listeners scott white the other day and first like is that just a collingwood thing you just he opens the batting oh we're up and about love calling oh, it's like, it's like <laughs> i got i got nothing mind, mind me while i've got a bit of a nauseous feeling but uh, anyway so well done mate in fact to, to you to your team congratulations but correct but you are hearing it from you don't worry i've got something covered i've got something coming up for you so don't worry about that right yeah hey um last week's app landlord insurance uh greg Rowe, We've got a downloadable, so uh, a lot of the a Good lot list. of the details within that podcast. There was oh, that was a good tip. Oh, there's another yeah. tip. Oh, no. So, so Emma and the crew here have pulled together a um uh, a little downloadable. So we're gonna put that in the show notes. So if anyone's thinking, oh, I'd actually like that, it'd be a nice little reference because yeah. uh, I'm about to make a phone call and get some landlord insurance. Um, just click on the link and a little shout out to a couple of our listeners, Ben, who reminded us that. There was 10 bullet points and number eight and number nine were the same as number six and number seven. So we fixed that up. <laughs> that, was a, that was a typo, as you'd imagine, because that means we've falsely sold a 10-point um, checklist and there's only eight, <laughs> but there was genuinely 10. So um, that's, that's been all sorted now. So if you did oh, yeah. click on that, go back and get it. It's been updated. Yeah. Everyone, everyone on Team uh, Property Couch has sorted that. So um, that's that. And I haven't said it for a while, Ben. Um, we have an agreement with our publishers where we can buy some books and give them away. Yep. So if you are new to our podcast and you'd like to get a copy of the Armchair Guide to Property Investing, all you need to do is go to thearmchairguide.com.au and you can get a free copy. You pay for the postage, tell us where to send it, we'll send it out to you. Um, and there's a, a number of people taking up that opportunity whilst we've got some books in the North Melbourne office there, Ben, where we can How do um, I send get them out. Price? Is, there a, is there a URL? There is, yeah, I mentioned it about 13 seconds ago, but I'll say it again for you, thearmchairguide.com.au. It's all right, mate. You haven't listened to me for 329 episodes. Why would you start now? So I can tell, Here's the truth, right? My, my, my machine binged. And so I needed to put it on. I needed to put it on do not disturb. And a typical man can't do two things at once. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's all right, mate. It takes the pressure uh, off me for the rest of the episode, right? So I've got one, I've got, I've got one in the bank. So, and um, you've, you've got a pick a webinar coming up. Yeah, we do. Um, so obviously, there's some huge reforms that are happening in the Victorian uh, Tenancy Act. So um, over 130 new reforms. How many? 130, mate. Very um, significant and, and one would call disruptive re reform. So we've gone to the top. Um, we've got Leah Callanan from Ooh, who's the president guns. of the REIV. Mm -hmm. And she also has her Metro property management business. So she is a guru in this stuff. So we have her um, as our guest speaker in regard to this. So she's um, an SME on this, Ben. She is a subject matter expert without a shadow of a doubt. So she's not a small, medium sized enterprise. She is a subject matter expert. So from that point of view, um, the date is Monday, the 22nd of March, mm -hmm. um, and it starts at 7 PM. And of mm -hmm. course, um, if you're not a picker member, you're not going to get the inside running on that. So obviously $5 for a year or $20 for five years. Um, you are, and I've seen the slide deck. It, it, it's significant, right? This, if you are planning to own property in Victoria or you do own property in Victoria, it is a must, must listen to. There is so much going on in terms of new laws um, that as a landlord, you need to be aware of. It's mm -hmm. absolutely critical you rock up um, and, and take a listen. So please, um, please get your membership up to date um, and you will be able to attend that. And obviously, if you can't make that night, um, all of um, our previous webinar recordings are available on demand in the members area of our website. So, 
So please jump on picker.as10.au and, and become a member and log in and get all of that great content. Nice little life hack there, Ben, right at the top of the show. If you cannot make Monday the 22nd at 7 p.m., but you do have some time at 9 p.m. that night, you could actually be a member. Well, probably you won't get it up that quickly, but the next day mm. um, you'll be able to watch it um, at your leisure. So very good. Now, Ben, uh, just, just in case I wasn't listening to you, did you mention the picker <laughs> URL then? Yeah. Thanks, mate. Very good. Okay, no worries, just checking. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, my mindset minute theme today is, of course, the journey through how to win friends and influence people, Ben. Oh. Are you ever wondering if this will ever end? It's actually self-indulgent to me because I'm loving revisiting the book, but uh, hopefully there's some, uh, some wisdom that um, people are able to take away. Today, chapter 24, talk about your own mistakes first. It isn't nearly so difficult to listen to a recital of your faults if the person criticizing begins by humbly admitting that he too is far from impeccable admitting one's own mistakes even when one hasn't corrected them can help convince somebody to change their behavior this was illustrated more recently by clarence Zer zerhusen of timonium in maryland when he discovered his 15 year old son was experimenting with cigarettes oh i thought, I thought you were about to say marijuana but no <laughs> Well, it doesn't say which color cigarettes, but uh, it's cigarettes experimentation. So naturally, I didn't want David to smoke, Mr. Zerhusen told us, but his mother and I smoked cigarettes. We were giving him a bad example all the time. I explained to Dave how I started smoking at about his age and how nicotine had got the best of me. And now it was nearly impossible for me to stop. I reminded him how irritating my cough was and how he had been after me to give up cigarettes not many years before. I didn't exhort him to stop or make threats or warn him about their dangers. All I did was point out how I was hooked on cigarettes and what it had meant to me. He thought about it for a while and decided he wouldn't smoke until he graduated from high school. As the years went by, David never did start smoking and has no intention of ever doing so. As a result of that conversation, I made the decision to stop smoking cigarettes myself and with the support of my family, I have succeeded. Mm. A good leader follows this principle, principle number 24. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. Now, Ben, there's a bit of wisdom in that, a little bit of um, timeless wisdom in that. But um, as you know, I like, to, I, I like to role play these, Ben. So I like to, I like to try and get it to land for me. So yes. I just, if I can indulge. Um, so Ben, I too have made poor decisions when choosing football clubs. I have, <laughs> I, it was a long time before I saw the light and changed as I too watched my t team participate in many, many, many grand finals and only to lose. So then upon reflection, I saw the light and I've since been able to find recreational peace like what I did there, recreational piece. I like Since it. I made the switch, um, I lied about the many, many um, grand final <laughs> losses. Yeah, but, I know where you're referencing. But for some reason, it felt really, really good to leave that bit in. <laughs> I don't know why. So, so Ben, just saying. So how do I go with role playing? Uh, terrific, terrific. I'll take that on board. Uh, um, there might be some some little gold in there for me in my you know dealing with my beautiful two boys. <laughs> don't listen to me at all. <laughs> so. oh, yeah, I'll get in line on that one. How, if, you, if you've got any tips on how to get your kids to listen, like write in, folks. We'd love to yeah. hear from you. Well, I'm, any... I'm making a lot of money out of them at the moment, mate. They um, <laughs> I'm trying to teach them how to um, to close the toilet door after their business, right? Yeah, and they are they're just like live in a tent, right? So. <laughs> The, the toilet door continues. So every, every time I go past the toilet door and it's open, I, I claim a dollar. So oh. last, last month, $9. This month, I'm up to 14 already. Oh. <laughs> it's just like taking money from a baby. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. If, if you, some people might write in on that, Ben, but it's for the kids' college fund, isn't it? So. <laughs> yeah, straight in the offset. And at the end of the day, you know, we're yeah. building a, you know, we're building a, a you know, and a state that is is for the next generations and the next generation. So that's right. So, but oh, I don't know how else to. You know what else do you do? If A then B. That's all I know, Ben. That's the only parenting wisdom right. I've got. If A yeah. then B. Yeah. If if you do A, then you get B, and that's a reinforce, reinforce, <laughs> reinforce. I don't know how many times you need to tell them. Like it. Like is fifteen thousand reminders just a little too many? <laughs> 
Mate, we could go on a big tangent here, couldn't we? So we better straighten up. But uh, we've got a very and, special and guest talking today. about admitting my failures. I am not the world's greatest parent. I am far from it, mate. <laughs> that is, I admit my uh, failures there. God. Well, well, in the interest of the uh, the topic, you're, you're about to sort of reflect on my my parenting. Then you know you're admitting yours first, so you're trying to correct my mistakes. I, um, <laughs> no, which which would probably be fair enough. Um, ask my wife. So. Um, Oh, mate, we've got a very special guest today. But before we do, I just want to, I just want to remind folks to def- definitely listen to, to our chat. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a rip-up. But also make sure you stick around for What's Property News because, Ben, you are going to cover uh, the, the fear of missing out, uh, what that means for people. Because we we've, we've always said don't jump in, um, but you're seeing the headlines, you're seeing what's happening in the property market. You've got that covered. In what's making property news so i don't normally give a little uh little prelude to what's coming but i just want to make sure people stick around for that because it's going to be good but uh all right let's cut to the interview we recently had with tom simons all right ben we've got a very special guest today we are talking with tom simons tom is a retired nrl player with a 10 having a 10-year professional career uh from 2009 to 2012 played for the sydney roosters from 2013 to 2016, played for the Manly Sea Eagles. And from 2016 to 2018, was in the Super League overseas, playing for the Huddersfield Giants. He's currently the Players Operation Manager with the Rugby League Players Association. He's also a long-time listener of The Property Couch. Welcome to The Property Couch, Tom. Cheers, Bryce. Yeah, good to jump on and, and hang out with you guys for a little bit. Mate, it's a pleasure. You and I have been chatting for probably about 12 to 18 months now, but uh, we've been talking about this for a little while. So it's actually nice to, uh, to get you on because there's, there's, there's lots we can talk about. I know you're a mad, passionate property person. Um, you love sort of the, the concepts of getting your finance in order and, and you're very passionate, uh, you know, particularly in the role that you're doing to make sure that the people that you represent also get an opportunity to, uh, to set themselves up. So there's a lot that we can talk about before Ben and I indulge in our passion to talk about all things sport. But um, before before we get there, can you give us a little backstory on um, what, you know, you were born and bred in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, so what, what were the conversations like about money over the dinner table for you when you were growing up? Sure, mate. I think you covered that pretty well. I'm a bit of a property um, tragic, so it's um, yeah, it's good to chew the fat with you guys. But uh, yeah, in terms of where I started, eastern suburbs, born and bred, um, we're very much a middle class family. Dad was a builder, and you know, mum worked and um, went to the local primary school at Clovelly. Lived in a, a property at Bronte. Played junior footy at um, Bondi United. So um, all the um, sort of standard stereotypes growing up. Um, Money was probably something that we were conscious of as a family. I think dad did a pretty good job of involving us kids in things to a degree. Well, we certainly knew what we couldn't go and spend our money on. Um, so he let us know a little bit about that. So I think, you know, fairly early on, um, we learned a few basics of, of money and saving and um, the fact that you know, dad had to work hard with his business and to keep the roof over our head was something that we all were aware of. And probably more into adulthood, uh, we've continued that transparency now, which has been quite nice. Tom, in terms of some of those takeaways, what were the what were the little messages in terms of how did he instill the value of money into your thinking as kids? Uh, I think um, we're probably mindful of not having too much excess. If we needed something, we would get it, but it would probably wouldn't be the you know the top brand or the U Butte steak or you know, the best cricket bat going around. Um, so don't get me wrong, we still um, had everything we needed. But, um, you know, if there was a cricket bat for 20 bucks and it was Kmart versus, uh, you know, the brand new Kookaburra, then I knew what one I was getting. <laughs> you mentioned your dad was a builder so, and you're a, a property tragic. Are they linked? Did you, did you get onto the site with your dad when you were younger? And um, was there any sort of trade activity that you did um, leading into, obviously, your sports career? Um, not really. I'm, I'm no good with my hands. Um, so I don't think I'd make a very good, um, builder. Dad's been, yeah, he, he built up some of our house actually growing up and he's still in the building industry. But, um, yeah, my love for property, um, was more around not building and not getting my hands dirty, but just the financial side of it. Um, yeah, I guess like many Australians, just the, the great Australian dream and, I'm um, also investing in property. Yeah. Dad did a little bit of that, but, um, yeah, it's probably something I, I, became more passionate about um, once I was an adult rather than something that men, uh, dad, you know, learn on the site, so to speak. 
Gotcha. You mentioned that um, uh, you know money was transparent when you're growing up, um, and where Ben and I are passionate about making money not a taboo over the kitchen table. Can you sort of let us know what some of those conversations were like? Did you get down to understanding the the ins and outs of mum and dad's money, or was it just um, you, you know you, you talked about the analogy of the cricket bat? Um, did they teach you budgeting? Is that something you learned later in life? If so, how did you do that? How did how did you develop your adult money skills? From the kitchen table and if there were any gaps how did you fill the gaps yeah i think um just generally in uh learning the value of um, saving and being conscious with our money was probably something i learned i don't necessarily think we discussed you know how much you know the mortgage repayments might have been or um, anything overly detailed but just being conscious as i said earlier was something that was instilled into us and also saving a bit of that delayed gratification sort of messaging. Um, I know that's a popular one on here, but yeah, I think um, the value of saving up, having to work hard, you know, whether it's when we we're really young doing a car wash and saving our money to, um, you know, then go and buy, you know, a new pair of footy boots or whatever it might've been. And then as we got a bit older, that was probably the same principles in terms of, of property. All right. If you're going out of the weekend, um, you know, you've got to balance that versus uh, if you do want to get a house to live in, how are you going to make it work? So Tom, it sounds like you got a good grounding in a bit of hard work and, and a bit of delayed gratification, which is always great. Did you find that when you were, you know, the passion for property, uh, linking that story, has that come from, you know, sort of having a look at what your dad was doing? Did he Was he a resi builder or commercial or did he do a mixture of both? What sort of building did he do? Uh, more residential. He had to work pretty hard and then after a while, it- you know, the physicality probably got the better of him. And now he um, moved into, you know, pre-purchase building and, and pest inspection. So I think that sort yeah. of treats him a little bit better. But in terms of answering your question, I think, you know, I, the delayed gratification was something I almost wanted to bypass because I was, you know, 20 and thought, oh, well, I want it all now. And um, how do I make that work? And that almost um, sparked part of my passion for, you know, investing in property you know, how do I climb the ladder a bit quicker and, you know, or try and skip a few steps? Um, probably turned out that uh, you, you can't necessarily, but um, <laughs> that was probably an attitude when I was a bit younger. Well, that, look, there's nothing wrong with that attitude in terms of, you know, uh, future orientation in terms of what you're trying to do. Um, but what, what do you reckon were some of the, sk- uh, the, the steps you wanted to skip as part of that story? Was it because you're about to go into a professional career, right? So what is potentially different about, your story and what we want to get into later in, in this episode is talking about really high income and then that income falling away. But in those earlier stages, did, did you think it was, you know, what were those earlier steps or what sort of trial and error did you find when you, when you were looking at your property investment journey? I think um, growing up in, you know, an area that is pretty affluent and expensive, um, Sydney in general, obviously, but even um, where I grew up in the Eastern suburbs, I don't necessarily uh, think, you know, the aim was necessarily about the financial numbers or the outcome in terms of being rich, but it was simply about, oh, how can we, um, you know, how can I move into, you know, when I was 20, it might've been, or 22, it might've been an apartment with your mate and, and own that property or, and as it got older, you know, might've been a house for the family. So it's probably more around um, the same things most others might, or a lot of other people might want, but just having um, been brought up in a pretty, um, expensive housing area I thought how am I going to make this work and so it probably start, started um, it got me thinking a little bit outside the box about trying something else because I didn't you know I don't think I could save all the way to where I wanted to get basically so I thought I'd have to do it another way. An interesting thing that you uh, we spoke about this uh, earlier today when we were chatting that um, you grow up in an area that is um, you're blessed you know to have all that's available in these areas. But then all of a sudden, as you grow up, it's not a given that you can just live around the corner from mum and dad like some people can. So they get a balance of, you know, still being able to afford close to mum and dad. Whereas for you in Sydney being priced out, there's a lot of people who are listening to this podcast would be able to relate to you, even even without having to talk about the professional sporting incomes that are on offer, that that they they grow up in areas where they have to go further and further out to actually be able to just buy property, let alone trying to be close to the, to the folks. Absolutely. Um, that's been in front of mind. I, I see that a lot now with, you know, a lot of my mates I grew up with um, starting to have young families and naturally it's quite hard to, to make it work. And, um, you know, but that's a bit of a fact of, of life here in Sydney. So it's, I sort of 
try not to dwell too much on why and just work out, oh, what are we going to do about it um, and try and make it work. You have the upside of growing up in Bronte, don't you? At least you got those <laughs> memories and then maybe, maybe you can circle back at some point in the future. Yeah, uh, it shouldn't, probably shouldn't be a sub story. I mean, I had um, you know, Bronte Beach on the, on the you know, short walk on the doorstep. So that's a pretty handy thing to have. Yeah, so I'm certainly not going to complain. Grew up in a, a lovely spot with some great family and friends nearby. But at the same time, you, you only know what you have. And um, probably much like uh, many families, you just think that's normal when you're growing up and um, I certainly did. Hmm. Now, Tom, it's, it is an interesting point because I'm, I'm curious to sort of explore this more around um, when those decisions are being made by yourself and your mates. Um, thinking about the bias decision quadrant, are you um, looking to move wider or are you happy to compromise? Like, did you, did you do the stepping stone strategy where it is about um, taking an apartment first, then looking at a townhouse and then looking at your first entry level home and then moving up to a more significant home. I mean, is that the sort of psychology of you and your mates in trying to stay in the same area? Or have you noticed that a couple of them have actually bitten the bullet and gone out to the uh, house and land package areas? Yeah, it's probably a bit of a mix, um, to be honest, Ben. I think there's not too many people who love uh, sacrificing or um, having to negotiate on one of those areas. Um, you see a lot of um, people in the eastern suburbs um, who potentially stayed home longer and seeing now probably a few more people who are considering or have moved um, out of Sydney altogether. Um, so that's certainly an option. Um, and there's probably a few people who have decided, oh, look, I just don't know how I'm going to make this work. And, and they may just decide to go down the, rent, the renting path. Um, for me, I'm very much at that um stage my life with the young family now and considering our next steps but you know probably 10 years ago when I was starting out my football journey um I wasn't necessarily always going to be in Sydney and it turned out that I wasn't so I was pretty aware that you know maybe the first step for me wasn't necessarily um a property you know next door it was you know looking elsewhere now you do have a property backstory, so we'll get to that shortly but um tell us a little bit about um moving through your teenage years then all of a sudden you get picked uh, to play for the Sydney Roosters and you, you know even you know we always hear headline level just the amazing incomes that these professional athletes are on but even even people that are you know 20th 30th 40th on the list have a minimum income that they get access to which is generally uh, correct me if I'm wrong in your code but um, generally significantly better than the average income anyway just at, um, at entry level so people are uh, are getting access to good incomes and how did you how did you deal with uh, that sort of spike? You know, where you, all of a sudden you've got access to cash, and then as your career goes on, um, that goes up. Did, were you were you able to harness that and and uh, squirrel it away, or did you did you buy into the lifestyle that that affords? Yeah, probably um, probably a bit of both. I, I think I managed to take advantage of it a little bit. Um, in saying that. Um, when I first started my career at, you know, around 20 years old, I would have been on uh, the minimum sort of full-time NRL wage at the time. And, you know, back in, you know, a decade ago, it might've been $50,000. Whereas now it might be, um, it's a little bit of a scaled system at the moment. You know, a top 30 player might start out at um, 75, 80K. Um, and, you know, if you're a top 25, it might be 110. So there is a base minimum wage there. Um, obviously the higher end players are on, you know, a, um, you know, huge figures. That's right. Big dollars. Um, but there's also that a little bit of a misconception around, I guess, the average wage in elite sports. I think um, you see, you hear in the media and um, sort of assume that everyone playing um, elite sports on a million dollars a year, but the reality is they're not. But I think you, you make a fair point um, when you're 20 years old and you have a minimum salary sort of base. Um, it's pretty good compared to, you know, most other people your age. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I wasn't on a, a huge lot, a lot of money um, initially, but I probably did manage to start saving and, and getting a decent plan in place originally. Um, saying that, I look back and think, um, you know, I spent a fair bit of cash hanging out with my mates and frittering away some of it, but I probably don't regret that. Um, not, not sure too many do. You've got to enjoy your young 20s, I reckon. <laughs> It's easy to look back in hindsight and go, oh, geez, I had a lot. But it, it, it takes something else to actually be able to act on it at the time. And I guess in, the, in those early days, you probably have that bulletproof, this will last for a long time. I can't imagine getting an injury, all that sort of stuff, which, um, as you know, you and I have chatted about the fact that we talked to Matt Sharma on this podcast. And um, that's his backstory around uh, you know, having his career cut short by 
by injury. So let's pivot to the property story then. When, when did you pick up on the fact that you should be investing in property and, and what did that look like and, um, and how did it go? Yeah, so um, my journey is probably, um, I've learned a lot by experience. I've got a um, fair appetite for risk, um, but I've probably learned um, a little bit about what not to do as, uh, as well as what to do. And I'm always pretty transparent about that. So um, yeah, but I think fairly early on about 21, I was exposed to a, you know, a variety of um, presentations um, from a variety of people in the property industry, a little bit young and naive, but also pretty ambitious and it sparked um, a really strong interest for me. So, um, you know, there was a couple in particular that struck a chord and I quickly went down a path of rent vesting um, as a strategy, essentially trying to accumulate while the, the income was, you know, decent, working off that sort of base level into a more um, average um, NRL salary for a few years. My strategy was build a, um, uh, a collection of properties here and, and see where we land. Um, and, you know, it, it started out okay. Um, the first property, as I said, I was, I was in, you know, living in Bondi and thought I'm not a, um, a great wicket. So, might have to buy elsewhere. I bought a, um, a unit out in Western Sydney and, and that did pretty well. I sold it about five years later and used the cash to buy a couple more um, investment properties um, up in Brisbane. So that was a bit of my journey. And I sort of went down that path and stuck at it for, you know, the best part of five or six years um, before sort of taking stock and thinking, all right, now, now what? Talk about now what in a sec, but can you show us what or help take us to the point where you talked about getting these presentations and um, in the NRL circles um, that piqued your interest? What what do these presentations look like, and and how do you how do you get invited to them? Uh, yeah, they they probably range from good quality to not so good quality. A few spruikers in there, and a few people who are actually um, trying to educate players. There are genuinely a lot of people out there that do want to help elite sports people, but there's also um, those that, you know, see opportunity for their business to make some sales, I suppose. So I think it's, you know, without being overly specific, because it's been a while now, I think, you know, back when I started, there was probably a little bit less um, regulation on some of that info being put forward and who was able to get in front of players. Um, It's probably a little bit more protected now, but at the same time, players still get exposed to different options opportunities, I suppose you'd call them via, um, you know, their agents or sponsors, you know, commercial partners with their, their clubs, um, or even just mates, you know, if you've got a, um, a team, um, from, you know, that includes players from, you know, 18 years of age to 35, it's a pretty broad spectrum. And there's a variety of different players on different incomes who have done different things in property. So once training finishes for the day, there's probably a few conversations going on amongst teammates saying, oh, what, what do you reckon? You know, who's helped you? What's, what's good? Tom, in those presentations, how many of them talked about existing property versus new property? <laughs> um, I can't remember one about existing property then. So. <laughs> <laughs> Probably tell um, us a little bit of the story. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, as I said before, I'm fairly transparent. That was, um, you know, I went down the journey of buying some brand new property and, and the um, potential pros and cons of doing so. Um, cash flow was good and I've had good rental yields. Um, but uh, on the downside, there hasn't been as much capital growth or, or you know, if any, um, for a couple. So, yeah, I mean, I wish I had the property couch uh, back when I was 20, put it that way. Oh, thank you for that. That was unscripted. <laughs> but um, so so, uh, how do you feel about um, that, what you just said? You know, you you went on this five to six year journey. You wanted, you, you wanted to back it in. You wanted to make sure that what you heard, you put into practice and, Ben signs off every week for 329 weeks saying knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. So you did act on it, but then there's the disappointment that comes from um, acting on it and, and it hasn't borne the fruit that you'd hope to. How, how do you reconcile that? How do you feel about that? Um, I'm pretty um, forward thinking, so I don't try and dwell on it too much, but at the same time, you've got to acknowledge it. Previously, I just wouldn't have had the you know knowledge or the awareness of maybe some of the things that I did do well and some of the things I didn't. But moving forward, I'd just like to, uh, you know, personally, I use that as an opportunity. Um, how, to, how do I correct this, the ship? Um, and then for others, um, I guess I can recognise, I guess, some of the pitfalls and maybe some of the good things that, you know, I was offered the opportunity to get involved with. Naturally, in my role at the RLPA and, you know, working with other, you know, young elite sports people, I'm really conscious of it and, um, you know, get 
players or anyone generally, you know, friends, just getting good education, basically doing a lot of you know, research, having people who are completely independent um, is something I'm now pretty passionate about. Mm. It's interesting, Tom. We, we have been through the journey of our business being able to deal with international sports athletes and also domestic athletes in the professional sphere. And um, we've had to also deal with player managers and, and a few other things on the journey. And, and it is interesting about, obviously, everyone, including our parents, have our best interests at heart, right? I mean, you'd like to think that that they would, you know, like to help you out. But I mean, I can even tell you my story about my mum going, do you sure you know what you're doing, Ben? You know, in terms of, you know, only out of care. And we saw that with some of the player managers in terms of that they wanted to have their input in terms of some of the the um, the information we were providing, right? And and you sort of then got to say to yourself, well, what does that player manager know about property um, that they haven't learned themselves or, you know, they have they spent many, many hours in terms of t- deep diving into that particular area of subject matter. And, and I think that's important for anyone who's, who's getting advice from people or, or taking opinions from people um, is to um, qualify and quantify that, right? I mean, if someone's been there before, you know, if Uncle Frank's been there before and, and built a solid portfolio and made the mistakes and is happy to share the wins and the losses and isn't necessarily just big, big noting one of one great property out of five that they've bought, um, that's going to be helpful. Uh, but, you know, there's ultimately a lot of people who, as I said, have a gesture of goodwill attached to them, but they really don't know what they're talking about. So I think that that's an important takeaway for anyone who's listening. Absolutely. I think, you know, you have to you know, tread your own path as well. I mean, as an individual, you kind of got to take a bit of responsibility too. Um, and I certainly have. Um, but at the same time, it is it's good to be surrounded with people who are basically experts in their their area. Now you mentioned player agents or even family for some people, they actually may be great steers um, and guide them well, but for many others, probably not so much because it might not be their area of expertise. So on the individual working out um, what to say, Oh, great. Thanks for that. But no, thanks. And, and the vice versa, um, what, what to take on board and what to act on. Um, you've got to have a little bit of responsibility as an individual too. Yeah, we're, we're really clear on that, Tom, in terms of if it is to be, it's up to me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to take on all the responsibility if you can outsource to some you know people who have advice and the same same as you as a professional you know sports sports athlete you would have definitely outsourced some of your training skill someone who's got your coaches you know your skills coaches your fitness coaches all of those still ring true but ultimately yeah you're you're responsible for the people that you uh that you mingle with and you and you take your advice from yeah, I certainly agree with that. I probably um, mean more so taking on yourself about then choosing who you then go and get your advice from, I suppose. Um, certainly wouldn't advise do everything on your own. But yeah, getting a variety of opinions and, and checking out different resources and professionals and then, you know, making a judgment call on where you think that you get the best advice from. Yeah, but I certainly um, agree that anyone really should be getting advice from professionals. I think I've heard it before in this industry around buying property. If you you know, you need a plumber um, to fix your toilet, you do it. And every day, things like that, you know, people are happy to get advice from the experts. But when we go and buy a house, um, we often give it a miss and it could be um, talking hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. So um, it's mm. a bit ironic. Yeah, when you count opportunity cost as well. So when when you bought those properties up in Brizzy, what year are we talking about here, Tom? Uh, probably from 20. 20- 12 or 13 um, to 2016, say. So. I think that's important for because if we timestamp it, if you think about our podcast, we kicked it off in 2015. And Ben and I are proud of the fact that we, we, we're one of the pioneers of the voices to help people understand what a spruker is and how to, you know, be able to understand what's good advice and bad advice. And But if you're back then, you know, um, there wasn't a lot, to be honest, it, that you, you you had to take it the advice of the people around you and you surround yourself with these people. So I guess part of the reflection for you is to go, well, again, you're, you're a doer. And I, and I can confer in all the conversations you and I have had over as long as we've known each other, you've always been positive, you've never dwelled on it, all those sorts of things. But um, it's important to understand that um, now people shouldn't have any excuses. You say, um, people should do their research. It's easier now that, you know, our podcast is one of 20, 30, 40 podcasts that you can listen to. Right. Um, so, uh, our book when we came out was from a, a reference of what, what we would talk to 
uh, to a client if we're having a one-on-one consultation rather than having a plane and a Porsche and everything behind us saying, look at me. So there's, there's a whole range of different angles and perspectives that people can actually tap into now that just wasn't available back then as well. So I think that's uh, I think that's important. But the, the, the thing is now that, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. It's very clear on what you should do. It's very clear on um, how you should do it going forward. And it's very clear on seeing what the signs are to avoid going forward. So that's my next question for you. You obviously now have a role um, in the players association with your code. Um, and I'm sure you want to use some of your, your backstory to help mentor, but what, what's some of the, what's some of the conversations and some of the, the messages that you're having in a mentoring capacity for the people that are, are now coming through the ranks of professional sport in your code? Um, yeah, I think it's really important aspect, um, you know, in professional sport, at least in NRL, um, the players have, you know, wellbeing and financial education programs in place. And I certainly encourage players to sort of give their full attention to those. But there's also the opportunity um, to make the most of their financial situation whilst they're in the game. That's probably the other message. Um, I think we've touched on, you know, getting quality advice. So that's one. But the other part is making the most of it. Um, I think, you know, something I realised throughout my career was that players have an opportunity generally to use their incomes um, whilst they're um, younger to, you know, basically improve their wealth position. And it could be via property. You know, I, I love um, what property can do. Um, maybe for others, it might be, you know, other methods, but the opportunity regardless is there um, whilst you're playing to be proactive and get a plan in place to um, basically leverage that. There's a lot of young players coming through now in a number of sports who are doing that you know, via off-field ways, you know, their own businesses or leveraging their, you know, their um, personality or their profile. But specifically with property, there's an opportunity there whilst you've got a decent income to get a head start so that once you do finish, whether it's one year's time because you blow your knee out or if it's in, you know, 10, 15 years after glittering career that you're, you know, at least as, as well said as you possibly could be. So that's probably the main one, I'd, I'd say. Is there any basic advice that they, they is there any is there any basic advice? I remember Matthew Lloyd from the AFL was talking about um, Kevin Sheedy, uh, his coach, and he just said, "Look, make sure you don't leave your your professional career without your house fully paid off." And is, is there any is there any sort of mantras like that um, that float through the circles just to you know because clearly we would want to have an advanced plan on that, but at, le- at the very least, if people could walk through their you know through their professional career with their house paid off, that's a pretty good head start. Yeah, I mean, that'd be a great result for a lot of players. For a lot of players, they may do even, you know, even better with some of the um, incomes that are available. Um, but for then, you know, for every person that's earning that sort of cash, there's, um, you know, someone who plays, you know, 20 games, and, you know, over three or four years and sort mm-hmm. of a low, lower earner as well. But um, yeah, I think that's a really common one, uh, Bryce. I think if there's not a really detailed plan in place, I think the general philosophy is um, of paying off a home is um, still around. And I mean, that's, that's, you know, better than some plans. Um, I like it. I think it's um, a pretty good place to start. I think it's fundamental, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you've got an opportunity to, to get a base line um, situation behind you and that, whether that's, that's a one bedroom apartment in Sydney or a, you know, three bedroom house in Canberra, whatever that looks like, I, I, I'd say it's a, you know, from your point of view, Tom, that, that would be a great, a benchmark to seeing those players who, as you say, for, for, for every one of the elite athletes who are higher paid, um, there's a lot who don't even make first grade, um, who are, who are still had an income coming through for three or four years whilst they, you know, challenged to try and make a career in the game. And if they could, you know, walk away with a, with a savings base or enough for a deposit for a house, um, as they start their careers, their working careers post their sporting careers, I think that's, that's a nice little legacy piece that the NRL and, and all codes can look at in terms of helping their um, their athletes move forward in their lives because we also we also hear about the stories of the you know the hangovers what's next you know they've dedicated uh, 12 15 years of their life to get to a stage to give them an opportunity um, and if they get there but they have a little glimpse of it but then don't quite make a regular spot they, they've got to reprogram their life and they, they, you know there's life after footy or life after sport as they say Absolutely. I think um, you touch on that transition piece, uh, piece when players exit the game um, after a long period. And it's a really tough time. I mean, even personally, um, it wasn't um, easy. But I've seen some, some horror stories and some, some players who have really, really struggled. Um, and it's something I'm super passionate about 
basically help him moving forward. Um, there is the opportunity there. Financial stress is a huge, huge one for um, elite sports people, you know, moving from, from that to post career, um, you know, the, the income dip, you know, if you take away even all the other things you mentioned, um, Ben, around, you know, the mental state and the purpose in life and, you know, family changes, but specifically talking um, financial, if you can get that, um, sorted and have a, a decent plan in place, a good wealth base. It just takes away, you know, a huge amount of the, the stress and allows the players to, you know, pivot into the next you know, phase with a little bit less pressure, or a little bit less um, difficulty, I suppose. Mm. So if you, if you, what you know now, Tom, if you were, if you were walking back into uh, the, you know, the, the Sydney Roosters back in 2009 again, um, and with the benefit of what you know, what, what, what would you do differently? Uh, I'd, probably have a, I'd probably try and take a, a longer-term view. It's probably easier said than done. Like I said, I, I've learned a, a lot through um, action, um, so I don't necessarily regret anything, but just having a longer-term view, um, even now I could probably implement that in my life um, a bit more. It's hard not to get caught up with um, tomorrow and next week. Um, but, yeah, I think as a general principle, I still think there's an ability to have that balance of being, you know, a youngster and having a good time, um, but just having a, a bit of a view of long term and um, allowing time to to get you where you want to go. Um, sounds a bit philosophical, probably, but um, yeah, I, I think you know, just giving um, a bit more time and a plan that it yeah, maybe is um, a bit more solid rather than trying to make a quick um, gain and, and get somewhere quicker than you probably need to. Mm. And Tom, in your in your playing career, did you did you have any of those welfare people around you in those earlier years talking about you know the the next stage, not only in your in your developing career, but also in in terms of you know making it count, um, you know, to be the best version of yourself? Certainly, um, there were some uh, really good influences I had in my career, um, whether they were employed in um, you know welfare or wellbeing roles. Um, or just generally older teammates. I had some, you know, some really quality um, senior players that, Mentors. you know, when I, f- yeah, exactly. When I first came into first grade, you know, might've been with your footy, of course, but, you know, for certainly off field, um, there were some guys that I really um, enjoyed learning off when I came into the game. And that's a really sort of safe place for a lot of young players, um, you know, older players. So that's one avenue, but, you know, there's for any player that comes in, they may have a variety of sources, whether it's family or, professional services at the club or you know like us at the the players association um, friends so there's probably going to be different avenues I think now there's um, players have got pretty good opportunity to get the you know advice and and support but um, yeah I I certainly think there was a few that helped me along the way for sure. So now uh, pivoting moving forward you you, you bought the property in the west um, you sold it you bought a couple up in Brisbane haven't performed as you would what what's um, and and everything we're about is lifestyle design so I know that uh, that you you bought into that what does the next five to ten years uh, look like what's the immediate steps that you're taking and what's what's the you know what's your north star what what are you what are you going towards at the moment that um, that you want property to fulfill for you yeah, Bryce, pretty clear um, now, uh, you know, just had a second um, second kid a couple of weeks back. Um, Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the, um, the missus did a great job. So I've got two young boys. Um, so that thing, that's put things in perspective a little bit the last couple of years. Um, so Roo- naturally... Roosters or, or sea eagles? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let them decide. I, I um, Everyone asks me that actually, who I support, but um, I've probably got a foot in both camps, I have to say. Well, you um, have to be reasonably neutral in your role too, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, I've 16 teams, 16 teams. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> um, no, I definitely got a soft spot for those two, obviously. Um, but yeah, I suppose that uh, families put that in, into perspective. Um, definitely want the, um, the great Australian dream, a family house um, and a nice lifestyle. You know, I've always grown up around the beach and um, enjoyed sport and, and family. So that's um, no different for me. That's a goal. Sydney's proving to be very, very challenging given how crazy the market's gone lately. So um, it's a goal and it's got to work out how to get there. Um, taking a few steps at the moment to try and make it work, but we'll, we'll see how we go. In terms of your goal setting um, uh, traits, what, what would you say is, you know, like when you're coming back to, you know, achieving first grade appearances and so forth, playing the 99 games that you did, did you, um, how did you set your goals and, and, and did you visualize them? Did you write them down 
what were some of the little habits that you developed around your goal setting in, in your sporting career? Yeah, I really value goal setting, um, but I probably value it more now than I did early days. Um, it's probably something that's underrated, I think. Um, it's almost when you're a youngster coming up, um, it's almost um, taboo to set your, your goals too high. Um, it's like, you know, be happy with where you are or, um, you know, maybe not so much now, but certainly when I was coming through, I was like, okay, great. I've played one game. This is awesome. But, you know, you're never happy with where you are, you, you know, onto the next, whether it's play 50 games or, you know, in your next contract. So um, I think for me early on, I had goals, but I wasn't as um, laser focused on them. I didn't necessarily write them down and, and visualize them and um, do everything I could to reach them. I probably got it, you know, I probably reached a few, but I also um, probably fell short of a few goals as well. Whereas now, you know, probably again, hindsight, um, I sound like an, an old guy now talking about when I was a youngster, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I certainly value that. Um, and I use, you know, goal setting probably more, um, you know, now in my day to day life than I used to when I was a player, but yeah, there's definitely the you know, power there where you write something, go all in, I think with a sporting career, what I learned is that um, it's pretty easy in a sense to have um, direction because it's right there in front of you every day, what you're doing, um, you're putting all your energy into it. So naturally that's your focus. Whereas, you know, post-career, I found that you've got a number of different um, things in your life that are important. Um, so, you know, you probably need to write down exactly what, what it is that you want to achieve. Well, it's important to segue. Goal without a date is just a dream, right? So you've now uh, recently gone through the planning process of knowing the end goal and where you want to get to. How important do you think that is, you know, you talked about goals and first game and how important do you think it is for people to actually go through the process of documenting the pathway for where they want to end up in their lifestyle design as you, as you just have? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. Um, particularly if you're um, a little bit rudderless or um, unsure of next steps, I think it's, you know, it's a really solid way of just working out, all right, how do I get from A to B? Um, it simplifies things a lot. I, I know I've had, you know, a couple of other friends who have done the property plan as well. Um, it's been super beneficial for them and given them, you know, taking away some stress. You know, for me, it's been really helpful in terms of clarifying things. But, um, you know, as we've spoke about a lot, Bryce, I'm a little bit, you know, I don't sit too, I don't sit still for too long. I'm a bit ambitious. So I sometimes look at them and start considering all these other options after bring it back, bring it back in and think, okay, actually, what are we doing here? Um, so it's, it's a good grounding point for me. Get the big rock in the jar first, Tom, and then we can build from that. Right? That's, that's the story, right? Yeah. And, and yes, you are fidgety, which is which is a good thing because you're an action taker, as you've said all along. But, uh, man, I think your story is really fascinating. I've, uh, I've certainly enjoyed uh, chatting with you for as long as we have. And um, I, I think there's real benefit in, in getting our community to hear your story as well because you have experienced a... Uh, you know, a platform that a lot of people don't, which is that professional sport platform. But you've, for the whole time that we've been chatting, you've been level-headed, you've, you, your, your ego is well and truly in check. And I think it's because you're grounded in um, uh, the important stuff and you're, you're prepared to, to do what it takes to get you and your family what they need to do. And I think, I think there's a really good message in that for everyone that it's um, whether, whether you are an entry-level job or whether you've got the highest profile job in, in the land, everyone still has the same desire and that's uh, to try and trap some so that they can create a, a bit of lifestyle design for whatever that is for them. And you're no different to that just because you've been, you know, as I said, with a profile. So mate, we, we, we certainly appreciate that you've, uh, you know, there's some transparency and there's some courage that comes from sharing your own backstory and sharing even the mistakes that you talked about as well. So, uh, mate, um, uh, yeah, from, from everyone on our uh, property couch community. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being so transparent. All right, Ben, obviously a great opportunity to speak to someone who's been at the, you know, represented at the highest level of their, uh, of their sport and, uh, but also is human, right? Made some mistakes. This is what's going through them just because they're on, uh, you know, in a, in a window of short-term opportunity doesn't mean that they also are making amazing decisions along the journey. You know, the quality of advice still matters. Yeah, it does. I mean, and where you get that advice is also a, an important takeaway there as well. I mean, you know, we talked about how it's important that, uh, you know, our family cares for us and they want to potentially guide us in the right direction, but they could also be a mooring line that we can't break from because they're scared of us, um, you know, failing in our, in our attempts to move forward. So what, what I loved about Tom's story is it's very much focused on that future orientation, those goal settings and, and, and also an element there of impatience, which, 
he's learning to to counter um, with getting knowledge and understanding and education. So I think from that point of view, yep, goal setting. I love that future orientation view. He's now you know sort of really focused on you know building out those goals and and interesting personal goals that relate to how property can help him achieve those personal goals. So I think there's there's some good stuff in there, and and, and this is why I love getting you know people on who are who are authentic and honest around their story. And, and as you said, I've worked, walked in those shoes. I know what it's about. And, and he's obviously trying to help other players who may have um, some significant income that's coming in uh, to their household in those shorter, you know, uh, productive years in professional sport. But you want to walk away with, you know, an asset or something or a foundation in behind that. And I think uh, that's great advice for, for the people that he's also now caring for um, in his role uh, inside the NRL. Yeah, I think the key takeaways for me were for those those people blessed to be in an opportunity where they've got a, a bonanza of income, don't waste it. Yeah. Um, and also for those who might not find themselves in that um, situation, uh, making mistakes is part of the journey. And and the third one for me is he now plans to become what he plans to become. Yeah. He's, gone and, he's gone and done a plan that says, I know what I need to do to achieve, um, again, I'll borrow your term, the North Star, I know where I'm headed. I know where I'm going. I know what foot, uh, what what step I need to do uh, to get into play. So good on him. Thanks for being transparent. Yeah, uh, terrific. I've been chatting with Tom for some time about the idea of coming on, and um, I think it's. Uh, I say this every time, Ben. I think it's brave when someone comes on and they sort of uh, lift the veil and let us know what's going on. So um, thanks for that. Hey, um, my life hack today is I'm I'm travelling to Sydney tomorrow um, afternoon to spend the weekend. In Sydney, it's the first time I've been on a plane for well over a year, and um, uh, the reason that's significant is because I used to spend more time in airport um, lounges yeah. than I did in my own lounge room for, for many years, right? So it's been a while, and you you've done it um, yourself recently. So, um, but travel pillows are an expensive accessory that have spent, spent a fair bit of time in the back of people's wardrobes for some time because we haven't been on planes as much anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. But um, uh, there is an alternate use for these, uh, Ben. So when you're in bed, uh, you can actually lie on these travel pillows uh, with your headphones on, listening to what you're listening to without it hurting, right? Ah. So, um, and this same applies if you're flying in a, uh, you're lucky enough to get a full row, probably more possible these days if you actually get on a plane <laughs> than in the past. But um, I'm an old school Gen Xer, Ben. So, um, AirPods are as fancy as I get with with earphones, but for some of the cool, you know, the really cool cats, they can get those bulky, you know, Beats or the Bose or the Sonys. Yeah. Um, and for those people who do have those really big ones, um, alternate use for travel pillows, Ben. Lie down, like it. not going to hurt you. Game changer. Yeah, lying on your side to listen to a potty or two. That sounds yeah. awesome. Excellent. And that's, and, that, and that's potty with a D. So a potty <laughs> or two. So there you go. What's making property news today, Ben? Well, Bryce, further to what we were talking about earlier in the show, I think there's we just need to get some context right. The media is out there going crazy around FOMO because it obviously it's clickbait. It works really, really well. And there's no doubt that the market is starting to move higher. But I just want to give some context. First bit of context is is around where are we, you know, in terms of generally speaking, the the median house price across Australia to where we were back in 2017. Mm -hmm. And contrary to popular belief about where the market's at, it's only 2.8% higher than the peak of 2017. Now, of course, there are markets within markets and we understand that there are certain markets that are moving. So that is understandable, but that's the context. The second part of that story is, okay, well, what's going to be happening in terms of um, future supply? Now, Westpac um, released a, a survey of over 2000 households across Australia. And they do this survey. So just to give you an idea, they did it in September, uh, September 19. They also did it uh, in October and now they've done it in February where the intentions to sell a property now. So that's people who are getting ready uh, to basically move to selling a property. And they ask that in the next five years. Now a third of the country, over a third now, is now ready to be selling their property. Now that's one in 10 at the moment. Uh, some are still waiting in terms to see what happens, but I just wanna give you an idea of, of how the dial has moved. So in September, 2019, 17% of households were planning to sell in the next five years. Now compare that to October, 2020, we had 30%. 
So effectively almost mm, double. Double. Now it has gone to double where it's in February now it's at 35%. So people are organizing their affairs and they're, they're looking to, um, to bring their properties to market. Now that is, a, that is obviously a positive news story in regards to new supply coming on for the, for the amount of demand that's in the market. Um, that is true. So I, I just want to make sure that people understand that this fear of missing out well, this cycle, you know, if I, if I then finish that conversation off with a statement that was made by Governor uh, Lowe last yesterday um, at the AFR event, um, and he was talking about um, lower interest rates for longer. The market is already pricing in interest rates going up um, earlier than the 2024 indications that have been provided by the RBA. And uh, Governor Lowe basically said yesterday, really, that's, that's not our position. You know, our position mm. is um, very much focused on interest rates lower for longer because they're going after um, wages growth. And ultimately that wages growth is about then moving sustainable inflation into their, to their band of two to 3%. So they are sort of saying that's, that's not our position. We, you know, that might be other people and other economists view of what's gonna happen. But we're saying really clear, interest rates are going to remain lower for longer. Now they need to do that because that's the, that's the signaling that they absolutely need to do to the market. But they then went on to say that property prices aren't part of their mandate. Um, and so there are other means by which uh, the market can be managed um, in terms of making sure that we don't get um, irrational exuberance, um, which is you know in the area of people basically um, creating a, a potential over overvaluation and um, a bubble um, in the property market. Well, we are a long, long way away from that. And this cycle um, at least has 12 to 18 months to run. So if you are experiencing some level of FOMO, don't be too panicked. Um, you know, there will be opportunities for you to come into this market over the next three to six months. And I just think that that's important for, for people to understand. Yeah, the, the view should be to get into the market in 2021 uh, not get into the market as soon as possible, right? Now, sure, you, 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 there, there will be some price movement, get it, but you're making long-term decisions on short-term data, right? So um, just, be, just be mindful that um, um, if you don't get in in March, that's okay. Um, yeah, and I'll, and I'll back that up even further, Bryce. So our good friends at CoreLogic also released um, their home value index results. Now, to put this into context, what they look at is they're looking at the trends in the different price ranges. So there's four quartiles. So you've obviously got the higher tier, which is the top 25% of values, the mid tier, and then the lower tier. So the mid tier is the 50%, and then you take the lowest 25%. So that's how they operate it. Now, what we did see, and, and when we're going to start reporting on um, price growth, and, and this month also is going to look like a very strong result, where property prices are moving at their fastest level for a long, long time. Well, that's because what they are doing is they're aggregating that data down to a median point. And if all of the higher end property prices, which is what we talk about in terms of the ripple effect, so the top 25% of property prices have moved 2.7% um, in the last month. Now, um, now that is you know, up from only a 0.5 in January now, in context, compared to the mid-tier range, that increased by 1.5% and the lower end increased by 1.2%. Now, that is the context of usually the higher end of the market is more volatile. So context around that, during the COVID period, that high end uh, from sort of peak to trough was negative 4.3% compared to the mid-tier range, which is negative one6 and then the lower end of the market only fell by 0.8. So it's coming from a lower base, but it's accelerating through. And, and when those higher end markets move, that obviously moves the median, which obviously then creates this emphasis that basically the whole market's moving really quickly. So my takeaway from that is if you're looking at the mid tier and the lower end of the market, there's still potentially gonna be some good buying opportunities in there. Um, and when we are talking about the high end, we're talking about property prices in the 1.2 million range. Now, not, there's not a lot of investors who can walk out and buy in that range. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to also say that there will be buying opportunities and there is definitely gonna be more stock um, available in that sort of middle range and that lower end of the range. So if you're buying in that 
400 to to a million range, I think you're going to have good buying opportunities throughout the course of 2021. Yeah, the, the point, the, the key point is more stock. And that's, that's, yep. that's the bit that, that we're wanting to, because you, January is quiet. February is always a, you're just a, just a, a jumble sale anyway. Everyone's like, you've just got all this pent up demand that's usually mm. flowing through from middle of December. So it kind of makes sense that February does it anyway. But then where the challenge is, is you've just got all this layered pent up demand that came from everyone being locked into their houses and stuff over, over a pandemic. So, but stock is well and truly the thing that, um, that alleviates this, but um, you just want to, and, and clearly it's easy for us to sit here, Ben, when you're someone who's listening to this going, I'm living at my mother and uh, you know, my in-laws house and um, I'm desperate to get into the market and I can't get it. Sure. I get that there's yep. some urgency around that, but um, you know, we're probably specifically talking to our investor community um, yep. around that. Cause I, I understand if I'm living at my mother's job, <laughs> all right, we might cut that bit out, but um, we <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but um, you know, the, the sense which we're just trying to say to the investor community, um, just, just see the goal of buying in 2021 because you're playing a 10, 15, 20 year game. Yeah. The fact that you're just desperate to get in no matter, no matter what. So um, good insights, mate, as always uh, with what's making property news. But um, we have jammed a fair bit into today, but uh, looking forward to uh, catching up with you again next week, Ben. But until then, knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Very well said. See you next week, folks. Hey there, folks, Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20, you can download it and consume it whenever you want. It's completely free and available now. And for those of you, just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice. We recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information. Now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.